The GovX Show is supported by Forrester, helping government organisations perform at their best. Visit forrester.com to learn more. Hello again. Welcome to another episode of the GovX Show. I'm Tim Coulthard, Community Director here at GovX Digital. I'm delighted to say that joining me today for another conversation is Lord Francis Maud. In light of the recent publishing of the Review of Cross-Cutting Functions and the Operation Spend Controls, a piece of work that he carried out in the autumn of last year to assess the current capability and performance of some of the operational functions of the civil service. Are they fit for purpose? Can they be improved? Are there efficiencies to be gained? So we're going to delve into some of those findings and obviously view that through the lens of the reform agenda that's happening more widely. So we have the Declaration on Government Reform published in June, a further signal of intent from the government of how they wish to evolve the public sector reform programme. Loads to unpack, so without further ado, we'll jump into the conversation with Francis. So Francis, welcome to the GovX show. Um, great to have you uh, joining us again uh, at a time when there's a huge amount going on in terms of government reform and, and your own work has come out and looking forward to diving into some of that with you uh, on this session today. Thank you. Good, very good to be with you again. Great stuff. Great stuff. So um, setting the scene, um, back, in, back in autumn of last year, um, you were asked to sort of revisit, maybe, maybe revisit isn't isn't necessarily the, the way it was sort of pitched, but come back in and look at the way the civil service is functioning. How does government function, governance structures, operational performance, all, all that sort of stuff. Um, and you joined us uh, for a previous episode, I think in sort of late summer last year, and there was a quote that sort of jumped out to me around the, the lack of a hardcore critical mass of technical capability in government. So you're, you're asked to come back in. Um, so when you when you when you came back and gave it a prod, uh, I guess my question would be, what what did you expect to find potentially, and then what did you find if we sort of take that overview for a kickoff? Well, I mean, it was uh, hard to resist the invitation to go and and, and look at it again. Um, uh, this is something I care about a great deal. Um, you know, looking at the cross cutting functions, this is not the glamour end of of government and politics. Um, and frankly, it's attracted far too little attention, either from ministers uh, or from senior civil servants. Um, you know, this, the route to the top is not seen to be in either civil service or politics, is not seen to be through these kinds of routes. Um, and, and that's a pity. Um, and so uh, I was keen to see what was happening. I picked up some concerns because I'm, you know, continued to be interested and I was seen to be very associated. So people were talked to me both people inside government and, and frankly, from, from outside government. And so I was picking up some concerns um, and I was keen to see what, were, what had gone well, what had continued to be developed, what might have gone backwards. And, and the truth is these days, if you're not going forward, you're going backward. Um, there is no steady state anymore. Um, uh, everyone knows that. Um, and yet in government, there's still a bit of a sort of residual belief that you can somehow achieve a kind of peak moment and then relax. You, you never can. Um, so uh, uh, I, I found some things had gone well, um, um, had, had progressed. Um, in commercial, for example, the commercial capability of, across government is, is much stronger than it was, and um, particularly in the, in the departments. Um, in the line departments. Um, some things, um, the mandate had become weakened in, in pretty much every case, actually, the mandate had got weakened. For, the, for these cross-cutting functions to work, um, you need three things. You need a strong and authoritative, technically credible leader at the center of government. You need a hard core of, not huge by any means, but a high, is what the phrase you, you, you use, hardcore a critical mass of high-end technical capability at the center. And you need a mandate, and those three things are interdependent. Without the mandate, you won't get or keep the right leader because they'll get fed up with having to spend all of their time uh, getting buy-in and goodwill. You want people who are capable of getting buy-in and goodwill, but you've got to have the mandate, otherwise they won't get people's attention. 
And so I was looking at all of these. I found that in most cases, the mandate had been eroded. Um, in several cases, the leadership um, had been, uh, frankly, um, eroded. Um, um, people that were in place when I uh, was there had been, frankly, pushed out, um, which was, was, was not helpful. Um, and, uh, and so there were some problems. Um, and in you know, the one where, which was the kind of gleaming success, um, the GDS, Government Digital Service, which had got us ranked best in the world by the UN for e-government, um, that had gone backwards in a big way. One part of it was still working very well. Um, Gov.uk was very strong still and played a crucial part during the pandemic. Um, but the rest of GDS was in much less good shape. It had grown in size quite a lot, but, but the capability was, was much less. I'd like to um, revisit that. I think it's worth, it's worth drilling into the GDS example because I think there's, there's a lot of learnings there. So <clears throat> would really like to sort of jump into that one um, further down the line. And um, so that, that, there's the overview. There's what you, you found as a sort of headline piece. So in terms, of, in terms of uncovering the detail and then taking some meaningful insights out of that, what was the process like in terms of you know, who you were speaking to and what kind of questions you were asking in order to really drill into the reality of how are things functioning, what capabilities are there, what improvements need to be made and so on? Like? Well, I talked to people. I mean, I talked to people in the functions principally at the centre, um, not so much in the department because uh, I know from my experience that if you haven't got it right at the centre, then, you, I mean, you may well have great capability in the departments. And I think in most cases, the capability is stronger in the departments than it was. That's not a substitute, though, for having that function strongly led from the centre. I and mean, that's that. We, we know that. Um, and yet there'd been a belief, you know, when, after I left, there were people saying, oh, well, you know, um, Francis's reforms are now embedded in the departments. And when, and when they say that, you know, what they really mean is they're embedded six feet under. They've been buried. Yeah, um, yeah. And, 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 and there's no assurance. There's no or much less, much less visibility, much less accountability for what's being done in the departments. And, you know, I totally understand that that's the that's been a historical model. Um, that departments have said we are accountable um, to our own minister and to parliament for how we spend public money, how we do delivery. The reality is in today's world, that's not enough. Um, and um, having close to real time accountability to the center uh, for how operational delivery happens. Uh, the overwhelming bulk of um, public money is spent through these cross-cutting functions. And if you're not running those at absolutely peak uh, effectiveness, then you know you're wasting a lot of money and you're failing your citizens because the um, projects and programs and policies which they've elected governments to deliver are not being delivered properly. And so you can't, you know, you can't treat this as being sort of the prisoner of some archaic theology that says oh, we're only accountable to parliament um, because that's only in arrears it's a very important accountability but it's only ever retrospective and what we created was something close to real-time accountability for how the money was actually being spent yeah yeah the reference that you made to to the scant attention being paid to some of those sort of technical functions and capabilities um and you've, you've stressed how important they are yet yeah, there's a sort of blind spot there. Why is that? Why aren't they valued more highly? I, I know you've talked in the past about the desire for a sort of critical mass of the very top tier of the civil service to be occupied by people with that technical and functional responsibility and expertise, which, which was sort of then, then create a sort of culture change. So why, why does that blind spot exist? Um, and, and then I guess the, the, the key point is how do we change it? Well, you have to change it by changing um, the customs and practices. Uh, why is it the case? It's just history. Um, you know, in, in North Cotrevelian put in place a system of competitive exams, which rewarded people coming into the civil service who had very good degrees in classics from Oxford and Cambridge. Um, nothing wrong with that, um, but um, it doesn't reward it. it the, the culture has all been about your route to the top is by being clever. And, and well educated and cultivated in a with a broad liberal 
arts education rather than having technical skills. In business, no one has a problem with people um, getting to the top, running, you know, commanding heights of, of businesses um, who've got a financial background or a technical or an engineering background, that this is regarded as a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, and, you know, it's more than 50 years since the Fulton Committee, the, um, looking at the civil service, um, um, rather derided the cult of the gifted amateur, um, that generally all you needed was clever generalists. Um, and you do need some clever generalists, and, you, and, and there are some, and they're, and they're very, very good, and they are indispensable. But it's not enough. Um, and, um, and the idea that uh, and I was shocked actually by how um, we were putting um, people in charge of huge departments with massive budgets who were woefully unprepared and it wasn't their fault I mean it was the system that you know assumed you're clever you've done clever policy jobs go and run this department with a with a, um, a budget of tens of billions and then wonder why it went wrong um, so people are woefully unprepared for these things and, and finding um, and, 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 and what you have to do is um, you have to change the pattern, you have to break the pattern um, and you have to start saying we are going to for the next period, we are going the most of the people we appoint to permanent secretary jobs are not going to be white collar policy mandarins, you know, there is still this class divide. You know, there's white collar mandarins that, and then there's blue collar people below the salt who do technical, you know, digital, financial, commercial um, uh, projects, um, uh, property, whatever. I mean, they're, they're lesser um, in, the, in the white hall culture. And so you need to say, well, actually, we're going to change that. And the way we'll change it is by preparing people in, in these groups with these skill sets preparing them for the top leadership roles and putting them in the top leadership roles. Yes. Um, and then you need to have a, uh, a presumption that you will have the, the, at the top of the civil service, you will have effectively a duopoly. You'll have a cabinet secretary as now, who is the leader of the white hall, white collar policy Mandarin uh, strand. And you'll have um, as now a CEO or a COO, who is leader of the operational side. And you will alternate which of those is the head of the civil service. And that's how you send the signal and that's how you break the pattern. But it's a, it's a destructive pattern at the moment and it has to change. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and sort of looping back to your earlier reference to GDS and, and the sort of epitome of that technical capability, um, there's a sense that it's lost its way somehow, um, maybe from its original uh, incarnation. What's, what's your sense of where GDS is now and what kind of organisation should it be in the future? Well, it's got an excellent leader. Um, Tom Reid is, is, is terrific. Um, he was head of digital in the cabinet office when I was there, did some did great work. He's, he's, he's exactly the right person. There's a slightly complicated structure um, around him. Um, there's a, a, a part time chair of the sort of chief digital officers office and, um, and, and then a, a, a full time chief digital officer. And, um, and, and the more I think about it, the, the more certain I am that this is the wrong structure. Um, it's this sort of uh whitehall obsession with governance um so you can't have you know you've got to have governance separated from delivery well it worked pretty well when we were doing it mike bracken was the government effectively the government's chief digital officer he reported um um, um to me in i mean with a reporting line also to a senior civil servant but had access to me and we made it work um, and we made it work very well. Um, so um, I don't think it's set up for success at the moment. Um, but, you know, these things aren't set in stone forever. And, and they, these things are, um, you know, we learn from the things that, that, that are tried. Um, uh, I mean, I was very struck um, to find that uh, something had been set up called the Automation Task Force. Um, completely separate from GDS. 
Uh, and I said, well, what, what does this do? Because, you know, in government, we don't do manufacturing. Um, if we're automating things, that is digital transformation, isn't it? Yes. So why isn't that being done by GDS? Um, well, and I was told GDS got out of that business. What? You're saying the GDS, which became the world leader in driving digital government, digital transformation, it was allowed to get out of that business. How absolutely insane and irresponsible was that? Um, and so I recommended that the automation task force should be put back into GDS. It hasn't been actually, it's been put under the chief digital officer and that's the wrong thing to do. It should be incorporated, it should be indistinguishable from the digital transformation capability uh, in GDS. So, you know, there are lots of things that are wrong. Um, the government, you know, ministers and, and um, the senior civil servants are looking to do the right things. It's not all being got right yet, but, uh, but it can be. And in, in terms of the sort of wider government reform agenda, um, we, we've referenced that there's various pieces of work being ongoing. Um, and obviously we have the declaration on government reform published, you know, just last month. So what kind of reception have you have you had in terms of the work you've been doing? Um, and, you know, looking all the way back to June of last year, Michael Gove's Ditchley lecture as well, which was very much set in the agenda and setting the tone for a future direction of reform. So what have you found more widely in terms of the appetite for change and the appetite for reform? Is it pushing an open door or are there still those sort of pockets of resistance? Um, I, I, well, Michael, Michael gets it, Theo Agnew, um, the minister responsible for all of this, gets it, Julia Lopez, the minister responsible for digital, she gets, they all get it, um, and the senior civil service get it. I think Simon Case and Alex Chisholm understand it. Are there pockets of resistance? Yes, of course there are. Um, there always were, there always will be. And, and the danger is, is when you come to, you know, um, when you come to implement it, it's all in the detail. Um, you can implement something, some, some, plenty of my recommendations are capable of being implemented in a way that looks like it's happening, but actually isn't. Uh, and a lot of this comes back to the mandate. Um, and, um, uh, and the mandate has to be incredibly carefully drafted. I took huge time uh, when I was the minister uh, refining these mandates to make sure they couldn't be gamed. Um, uh, and they all and, and they did, were all gamed, and then you kind of block the block the loopholes as best you can. But you know, this is there's the, there will be a lot of lip service. What what government civil service is very good at is kind of embracing the words without the substance. Yes, um, yes. So in the early days um, of um, moving towards the GDS approach. I would find people doing IT projects who would say, no, no, we're definitely doing this in an agile way. They weren't, they were doing it the old way. They were just calling it agile. Um, and so if people pick up the buzzword, so people say we're doing government as a platform. No, they're not. Um, and no government is really doing, doing government as a platform. And why? Because actually, if you do, if you start to create government as a platform and do it properly, you're starting to erode uh, the boundaries of existing structures um, in, in a way that is, in my view, good and disruptive because these are archaic structures um, which, which inhibit rather than help the effective discharge of, of public uh, functions. And in terms of that, um, the, the reality of implementation versus the sort of lip service piece, um, in, in terms of the government's declaration on reform, you know we've got permanent secretaries and ministers signing up to this and and in launching it there was a, there was a sort of rhetoric around some of the some of the changes already being implemented some of the changes are underway are you, are you getting that sense that there is momentum and there is change already happening or or is it maybe buried beneath the surface no no i think some of it is happening for sure and i think one of the things which is much better and this is very much to the credit of, of simon case and alex chisholm um is that they, they are seeing how essential it is um, that this is seen to be driven by ministers and, and civil service leaders together. I think one of the problems we had uh, when I was doing this is um, uh, while Jeremy Hayward actually was um, inherently, a, a, a instinctively a reformer, 
Um, I think he was very inhibited by and conflicted by um, the attitude of some of the most senior uh, departmental um, permanent secretaries. Um, and so, you know, it is always, it's always said that in any big change program, um, there are only three things that matter, communication, communication, communication. Um, and you have to be telling people all the time an unmistakable message. And so they have no, they, so you absolutely exclude the possibility for rumor, speculation, misinformation, which otherwise will tend to abound. And if people aren't hearing an, an unequivocally um, strong message, but both from the political and the civil service leadership, then it won't happen because people will always take refuge in, um, in, the, in the mixed messages. So I think the way Michael and Theo are setting this up um, with Simon and Alex Chisholm is absolutely the right way to do it. Um, but then people have to see that coming through in the rigorous implementation, detailed implementation of, of, of change. And finally, I suppose, if given what we've been through in terms of the pandemic and the incredible um, constraints on public resources and the huge pressures that, that we're dealing with, what, what are the risks if we don't get this right, if this, this, this meaningful programme of change isn't effective, where do we end up? And so therefore, what's, what's the imperative that it must work? Well, I mean, the, um, if, if it doesn't get done right, I mean, is the world going to fall in? No. Um, it's just that it's a massive opportunity wasted. Um, and, you know, the public finances are get every, in every country in the world are strained coming out of, you know, the, both the, uh, the hit to revenues from the economic downturn um, and the necessity for much higher spending, both for business and employment support, but also for healthcare costs mean the public finances are, are, are under massive pressure. And, and that means there should be everyone in, in the public sector should feel an, an absolute obligation to do things differently. And, and not to say we'll, we'll just kind of go back and do things a bit better. There are opportunities through technology uh, to do things um, uh, transformatively better. Um, to take real sort of quantum leaps in, in progress. Um, and, in, and these things don't happen spontaneously. They happen because uh, their leadership, it happen because of leadership. And, and I see there's a real opportunity in the UK today with, with the right leadership in the civil service and the right leadership among ministers to see this through and make it happen. But, uh, but, it, but you know, it has to be a real change substantive change not sort of embracing the words um but really really going for it well that's a that's a stirring note on which to leave it i think you know a rallying cry for everybody in, in sort of public service to to get involved in, this, in the process of reforms we've seen pockets of it we've seen some you know innovative services and digital pivoting in terms of the during the pandemic so now embedding that kind of culture of change and that greater appetite for risk are, are kind of key to drive in this program of, of change so we'll we'll watch with interest and hope that it hope that it gains the traction it deserves um, but in the meantime it's been it's been a real pleasure to delve into some of the um, research and, and the findings from your report so just want to say thank you thank you for joining us Francis pleasure really good to be with you so thanks again to Lord Francis Maud for joining us today for the episode interesting conversation to hear how the government reform agenda is moving how things have changed in the 10 years since he last lifted the bonnet of government capability to see how the civil service is functioning, what those core capabilities are like, whether there's progress being made, how GDS has evolved. All fascinating stuff for anybody with interest in the government transformation agenda. So hugely grateful for him for joining us for that conversation today. We'll watch with interest to see how some of the recommendations play out in the weeks, months and years ahead. That's all for now. I'll be along soon with another conversation with a government change maker. But until then, goodbye.